we are going to hear from a, a, an individual who has dedicated much of his life and his career to the protection of wild nature and its biodiversity. A short biography of Neville Winchester. Dr. Neville Winchester is currently a research entomologist and a teaching staff member in the Biological Sciences Department at the University of Victoria. His special areas of research and interest include diversity of arthropod, ancient rainforest ecology, and conservation biology. Currently, he is on the board of directors for the International Canopy Network, is a project manager and principal investigator for New World Forest for the Global Canopy Project. He has served as the president of the Entomological Society of British Columbia, scientific committee member for the Biological Survey of Canada, and is a member of the Entomological Society of Canada and the Society for Conservation Biology. His doctoral work in the Carmanna Valley was instrumental in its eventual protection as a provincial park, and he continues to demonstrate the uniqueness of these areas with emphasis on the organisms that live in the canopies of British Columbia's ancient rainforests. As well as doing research in temperate ecosystems, he has done high canopy work in French Guyana, Gabon, Malaysia, Thailand, Costa Rica, Northern Ethiopia, and just recently in Panama as part of an international biodiversity project. I would like you to help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Neville Winchester. I stood here in 90s, well, I guess in the early 90s, and then defended my thesis in 97. And I, I was a young person then, <laughs> trying to address exactly the same issues that you're here to hear about and are addressing on the floor. There's no difference. The only difference is the players on the field and in the government have changed. Mm -hmm. The outcome is exactly the same, and that's incredibly disappointing to me. Mm -hmm. I actually naively thought that objective evidence meant something and that people that make decisions would use that as they did in the Carmana to set that area aside. Well, things, I'm here to say things haven't changed. It's time to do something. So I might pop off a few times up here <laughs> because, because I'm essentially pissed. I mean, this is ridiculous. So big trees, not big stumps. I thought, hey, this is good. This is Paul George's book. This is absolutely everything we did is in this book. And everything that he and the Western Wilderness Committee did is in it. I see us doing this, a very similar thing, but ramping it up, certainly with things like social media, et cetera. I mean, it's time to put an end to this uh, destruction. So tonight, I'm just going to pontificate, blast off, <laughs> put everybody in a good frame of mind, hopefully, because we're here to celebrate the biodiversity of these really important areas. It's a biodiversity bonanza out there. Holy smokes. How could we wantingly cause species to go extinct? Oh yeah, that happens here in these northern temperate rainforests. I'm pretty much convinced after all the studies we've done that that's a fact. So and I'll explain that as we go through that. So what's it like to be in a top canopy, especially with someone like me that's afraid of heights? I hate heights. <laughs> it was the worst thing that ever happened to me and I'll explain how the Carmana project sort of got going. And when I say Carmana, I could be saying Walbrand. There's no difference to me, except for a time factor. I'm probably too old to climb these trees now. I don't know. <laughs> you climb these trees, and it's absolutely spectacular. It is a place of many floors. Well, that came from a, the tropical canopy biologists, my colleagues that work in some really unique places. There's sort of this layering effect, if you want, and there's different species associated with each layer. Well, guess what? Our northern temperate forests not quite as elaborate maybe, not as many species, but there is this layering effect. There are species that are markedly different than what's on the forest floor, and there's species that are specific to 30 meters, 60 meters, and above. It's incredible. They just happen to be small. Doesn't matter to me, a species is a species. So we're gonna try and get to the celebration part. Maybe as I rant and rave, that might be cause to celebrate, I don't know. Counting the uncounted. So as we sit there, right, as you sit here right now, how many species are in the Walbrand Valley? We should all have our, what do we have? iPods, Surface Pro 3s, gosh knows what, piece of paper and pencil, all oh, that would do. Thank you. Write down a number. Because we're managing these areas for biodiversity, are we not? That's what we're told. How can you manage something when you don't know what's there? It's unbelievable. Okay, well. You know, it's really nice as a, a scientist, although I almost 
hesitate to say that now. Um, but think of this system as islands. And this is where this islands in the sky comes from. Because what do we know about islands? Well, that's where a lot of really neat speciation occurs, where evolution occurs. It occurs in these areas that are isolated. Now, we think of island biogeography by Wilson and MacArthur. We think way back to the, that work. And they were talking essentially about islands surrounded by water. Those same processes have been transferred over the last 20 plus years for sure onto terrestrial environments. These are islands. And the same type of thing could occur in these areas that are isolated from their ground counterparts. Well, you know, much of this might be sort of similar to what Bobby was saying. You know, this is so cool. Three, a, a paper that came out of, uh, in Britain just a little while ago, three trillion call this pale blue dot home. So three trillion what? Three trillion, well, we're not quite their population human yet. Goodness grief. Well, we're talking about trees. So why is there an issue? There's three trillion trees. Sounds pretty good, but it doesn't sound good when you put it in this context. The total number of trees on the planet has dropped by almost 50%. There used to be six trillion trees. And that's only be, happened since human civilization began. Mm -hmm. So if these forests, if these trees essentially are the, the framework for a lot of evolutionary processes, there's been a lot of extinction spasms that have occurred due to our loss of these trees. So would we want to lose ancient forest trees in the Walbrand, the Carmana, anywhere in BC because we can act locally? The answer is conclusively no. And so we're left with what are we going to do about it? I have some ideas. <laughs> and they range, by the way. Well, it was a really start of a bad day 65 million years ago, was it not? I mean, this put an end to a lot of species, a lot of processes, etc. And we can all understand that. This wasn't ordered by the premier of some province. It just, it happened. I'm pretty convinced of that. However, we can look at a similar type of situation. That bad day has continued into 2016. Now I can steal, I've stolen a lot of slides from the ancient forest group, etc., which is, I think is fine for this talk. So what do you think that this person is thinking about as we look at this mass destruction? This is on the ground. Well, maybe he's thinking it's due to grief. And I would certainly say that we have this frontier attitude, as we heard earlier on, this, it's an unlimited resource and we have the right to just go in and take it, which we know we don't, and that's what's happened. But I would say certainly as we evolved in the Carmana days, this sort of outright greed was at least tempered a little bit. Would I say in 2016 it applies? Oh, absolutely. It seems to swung right back to let's extract the last of our, that resource, treat it as something economical, get it out of BC, and make some money for a few people. Well, how are we going to maintain biodiversity if we're totally ignorant? So ignorance falls into this for sure. You know, we just don't know. And I'd like to know, how is that possible with all of the work that's been done and certainly some 30 publications that we've put out to say how special these areas are as repositories of biodiversity? Well, you can just be plain ass arrogant to ignore that information. And these two things put together are really dangerous for people that make decisions. They refuse to objectively look at the evidence that's there. And they just take this, I stand on this, but it's too high, this platform. And wow, we're going to make this decision irregardless of the evidence that's out there. And we can do that, right? Because technology is going to save us. We can replant these areas, and can we not get those three trillion trees up to six trillion? Likely not, and there's issues with that for sure. Even if we believe that we can replant these areas, are we going to leave trees in a rotation four, five, six, seven hundred years plus of age? No, we're not going to do that at all. We're going to lose those trees and lose them forever. Well, I battled so many politicians on this. This is one person for sure, not to say any, 
<laughs> not to say anything bad, but I could put anybody's, uh, well, not anybody, I could put a lot of people up here. This was my fight at the tail end of my thesis. Your fight is probably something like this, <laughs> you know? But it hasn't changed, it's exactly the same, you know? There are some things we made in progress in silviculture, growing seedlings, et cetera, but I'm telling you, it's not an ancient force. And it loses that whole biodiversity principle. That's not the point of having a second growth force, harvesting trees from, I don't know if it's an 80 to 130 year rotation. Or less. Or less. And hey, that's a farm, do it. So why are we logging ancient forests? As we've heard, there's hardly any of them left. Then in 97, I mean, I used to famously say, hey, we have six watersheds on Vancouver Island that are over 6,500 hectares in size. We should save every one of them. And I, it's lower now. And my point is, why? It's, we're not talking about jobs, as we heard. I said on the CBC this morning, it's got nothing to do with jobs. These are short-term jobs if we think that we're going to log ancient forests and take these trees out. We've proven that. We've gone from what? <laughs> six trillion to three trillion trees. So globally, we've done a really bad job. And certainly on Vancouver Island, it hasn't been any better. Well, my sort of maps pale in comparison to the Bobby's. Bobby, I should have stolen your slides. So green is good. That's all we have to see from way at the back. That's ancient forest. Well, 2012, what are we looking at? Where's the ancient forest? Well, it's highly fragmented. One of the last spots left is the Carmana wall brand. I mean, it's still a fragment if I look at it that way. And it is absolutely worth its weight in gold in terms of protection. So large scale logging threats continue in ancient forests and throughout BC and they are supported by the BC government. There's no doubt about that support. And we've all seen that, we've gone all out, we've all been out in the field We've been on the roads, we've seen exactly this. It's a hard thing to overcome. Somehow, we can take out these giant old trees and we can replace them. Often at times, not even with the same species, but if we're talking sick as spruce here, wow, you tell me what's the difference between these trees, let's say they go up to <coughs> 20, 30, 40, 50 years of age. How does that compare to these trees? Absolutely, there is no comparison. It's a total loss of biodiversity from the original state. Sure, there are some species that can use these sort of seedlings, second growth forests, but there's a whole lot of species that depend directly on the structural integrity contained in these ancient forests. Okay, so we need to do something to make sure that the last remnant fragments don't get Harvested. Well, that would be in the Carmanta wall brand for us, the wall brand. If you want to narrow that down. Well, I stole this as well. Is everybody happy with this? Well, I'm happy about this. Oh my goodness, I thought, you know, I could age rapidly, and I did. I turned absolutely with Dr. Richard Ring, who Richard's somewhere in the audience, my PhD supervisor. Richard, are you still awake? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> So incredible support for, uh, for my doctoral work, for sure. It involved over 40 taxonomists from North America, and some of those taxonomists have continued this sort of fight, and Rob Bennett is, in the, is over here. So an, ex, an expert on spiders, and you may say, oh, well, spiders, I'm say, they're one of the most important groups in this old growth or ancient forest, mm -hmm. from the canopy to the forest floor. Okay, I look at this and I go, wow, great. You're going, oh, this isn't great. Well, this isn't great for me because this is a classic representation of fragmentation. Mm -hmm. You've taken some conti contiguous set of or force and you fragmented the you know what out of them. And so this is what you're left with. You're saying, oh, well, we maintain biodiversity because every species we're talking about in that biodiversity network, they can get between areas so they can disperse between a logged out area and a good area in terms of there's ancient forest trees. And we've shown that that just is not the case. Many of these species are poor dispersers. They are absolutely locked into the tree that they end up in. 
that's it. You take that tree down, you lose those species. Now maybe the extinction spasms at the population level, that's bad enough. It's really hard as a scientist to prove endemism, species that are found there and nowhere else. But I'm saying to you right now is that that does occur. We've got several <laughs> examples from the massive amount of sampling that we've done that we only record these species in that ancient forest trees. Was everybody in a celebratory mode? Yeah. I don't want to get everybody, you know. Well, I do. I want to get you riled up. Come on, we've got to do something. Uh-oh. Well, some people have done something. A bunch of rednecks. Oh, my goodness. A bunch of tree huggers. Oh, all of these things. It's absolutely incredible. But I would say to this audience, I'd say to anyone, what's the secret of success when you do this? Because it's labor-intensive. You know, it's not a huge amount of money, if any at all, in this. Um, you need to be informed, for sure. This is what makes, I think, a good environmentalist. Be informed, certainly, of the issue, and I think a lot of people with this issue, issue are. You've got to be able to communicate. Uh, well, a lot better than I am at doing this, for sure. So communication's uh, most important. And we should, whenever we can, support conservation groups. And there's a lot of groups, Friends of the Walgren, um, Ancient Forest Alliance, Western Canada Wilderness Committee, and the list can go on. But whenever possible, we should hopefully want to support those groups. And while you're doing all of this, the thing is to try and keep your perspective. Try and keep things real if you want. I mean, you know that we're fighting the good fight. All right, because we're not, on, as that slide I showed before, we're not ignorant and we're certainly not arrogant. We have a, we're informed and have a good idea of why we want to have these particular forests left. Not very many of them. Well, I naively thought as a scientist, I can provide this objective information. Well, this publication just came out and these, this journal is a fairly good journal. There's a huge collection of 16 people. You can't even find my name hardly on this. Um, and what's the title? This just came out in, in late 2015. Arthropod Distribution in a Tropical Rainforest, Tackling a Four-Dimensional Puzzle. I'm saying that what we found there is exactly the same as if the title had been Arthropod Distribution in a Tempered Rainforest, Tackling a Four-Dimensional Puzzle. What we found in Panama, different players but the proportionality and the same sort of specificity is exactly what we find in the wall brand. I see no difference. I can take findings from the Carmana wall brand, and I can go to each of the canopy sites, 16 of them in total around the world that we've done work in, find exactly the same thing. Wow, is what I say as a scientist. Well, who cares about journal articles? Who reads those things? <laughs> Well, we did the same thing with the Carmana Walbrand data. And my PhD student at the time, just a little while ago, Zoe Lindo, she graduated. She's now doing wonderful things at Western. She's a, a real, she was a real canopy sort of person for sure. Articulated a lot of things and did some absolutely blazing work. We published a lot of this stuff here, just some a brief collection of books. So the, evi the, the objective evidence is out there. It's easy to understand. Well, notice I haven't got to the point where we're looking at unique species and all of this stuff. Well, if you've hung around the field with E.O. Wilson in the center panel here, it's sort of the, the biodiversity loss is Earth's eminent or immense and hidden tragedy. I mean, Wilson's like Darwin's natural era. You spend any time in the field, it doesn't matter what forest you're in, he is absolutely on point. And the great thing about that is he's at heart a natural historian. He absolutely has a keen power of observation. He can see what's around him and he can put things together. He's brilliant. These other two guys are just my canopy colleagues. They're brilliant too, no doubt about it. But what's the problem that we're all faced with and we're faced with today? We're such short-term memories. Biodiversity loss has been eased off. It's been punted off the stage due to something crazy like climate change. 
I mean, holy smokes, climate change this, climate change that. You want to write a grant to get funding, you better put climate change in. Because, you know, we fixed all the biodiversity problems. Yeah, that's what's happened. Well, wait a second. There's something going on here. And this is what we see. Now, this is great, but they're really, in some sense, I'm going to show you, or try to tell you, we're missing the point. You know, it should be people's Save the Rainforest march still, because we have not solved any of the issues, biodiversity issues, and the importance of these rainforests. Haven't solved it at all. And you can say, well, hey, climate's going to be, quote, more important. Really? Well, the Global Canopy Program was a groundbreaking initiative by Alan Watt and a few other people out of Oxford, and they are major players on the, the international scene for sure. But look at this. Linking major studies of forest canopies addressing biodiversity, remember that forgotten word? And climate. This was back in 2003, for crying out loud. And how those two things dovetail um, on a global uh, basis. Well, what, what can we take home from that? What is the function of biodiversity? We could say, who cares? But we don't want to fold back into that slide where it's, whoa, we're one of those top categories like we're ignorant. Wow, what is the function of biodiversity? One of them is regulation of climate. So am I missing the point here? It's biodiversity we should be concerned with for sure because a lot of that folds right into the climate argument. If we maintain our forests properly, whatever that is, um, then we should be able to address many of the features of climate change, many of those problems. But remember, biodiversity and protection of rainforest, that doesn't exist on the stage anymore. Well, I'm here to say I think it should, and it's going to be up to all of us to let's get going on this. You know, we don't have to worry about the rest of that slide, but there's countless academic arguments about the importance in ecosystem services of intact systems. I mean, it's an academic argument because none of that is really put into play. Um, there's some thought there is by some well-meaning individuals, but at the end result is we just lose that habitat. I mean, if you don't believe me, ask us, what act do we have? Well, don't we have a SARA Act? It's a Species at Risk Act. Is there an issue with that? Absolutely, for me, and it has been ever since its inception. It's no wonder I have no friends in the ministry. <laughs> I don't want a SARA Act. I want a HERA Act, Habitat at Risk Act. Why are we looking at single species when we should be looking at habitat? There would be no question in the world that ancient forests and northern temperate areas should be conserved. End of discussion. I don't even want to know the species that are in those areas. It's so evident. Oh, I feel better. <laughs> well, why are forest canopies important? There's a whole set of, of reasons. Clara and my colleague, at a at, over in Oxford, put this science article out. Well, 40% of all species on the Earth's surface are associated with these canopies. Well, you know, there's a lot of tropical information here, but on top of that, our northern temperate forests have a whole set of species that also fit into this and contribute to that 40%. <coughs> well, we're talking about maybe processes, maybe it's hydrology and precipitation, rising CO2, volatile organic carbons, all of these things. And I can tell you right now, as I said this morning on the CBC, our northern temperate forests sequester more carbon than tropical forests. They are carbon sinks. And I'm certainly not an expert in that field, but a lot of people at R would say they are incredibly valuable areas to retain. And there's lots of academic reasons, but I just have to put the period after, let's retain these areas. Somehow, I can look at carbon, a carbon sink, if you want. I can understand that. I can understand that it's linked to climate and that we should be doing everything to make sure that we still have those forests to act as sinks. That gets rid of at least a little bit of the climate issue, does it not? Or addresses it? Well, these are a whole bunch of other sort of systems in here. And really, this global canopy group has been instrumental in this carbon trading, if you want, with their red document, et cetera, which I'm not going to get in, into here. Well, rainforest canopies really fit into 
flood risk, and that would apply here for sure. Disease outbreaks, more of a tropical phenomenon, but it doesn't necessarily have to be if everybody's looking at the news. And there's all these new things happening. So, you know, if I'm pregnant, I am not going to Brazil <laughs> at all. And it's gonna, you're gonna see these big hitters arise. And ask yourself, why did that happen? Well, that's a million dollar question. So this is what I mean by the global climate, or the global uh, canopy group. This was in 2007 for crying out loud. These are not new ideas that just popped off the shelf. They put this together. Um, Andrew Mitchell, Alan Watt, Nigel Stork, a whole bunch of people for sure. Um, talking about the importance of conserving forests while they're concentrating on some areas that are really hard hit. I mean, if you think it's bad here, there are several areas in Indonesia, Borneo, all over the place. Forests are gone and replaced by palm oil plantations. And I mean gone. There is nothing left. So that's why they're trying to hit this really hard. But again, as I'll do in, in this talk, if everybody's still awake, uh, you can easily replace everything I say about what I've learned in the tropics with temperate forests. There's no difference. There's just more spectacular shots. So maybe this is the one time I thought, hey, this would be great that I'm, that I'm in the top of a tree. Because when we're doing research in the Bellum Forest, which is a tiger reserve, this is just a wonderful creature that I just didn't want to walk into, necessarily. I'm fine observing taking pictures from afar. But I was there to study these lantern bugs. You know? And these are canopy dwellers, a lot of them. They communicate by flashing a semaphore. And it's different, different species at different heights flashing different signals. Maybe I, I thought for a, a long time one of the basic sim signal was leave the tree, leave the tree. <laughs> but I, I don't know. What I'd like to do for a few minutes is say, how are we going to digest all of this? I think there's four concepts that we could address. Biophilia. Well, well, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Everybody here, I'm certain, has a strong biophilia ethic, if you want. Oh, nice to see. Can't you tell? Rarefied air. Perfect. How about biodiversity? It's thrown around all over the place, but, you know, I guess I can't hand out paper since that comes from trees, unless it's a second growth tree. I don't know. What's biodiversity? I would guarantee that everybody would put down something different. You know, and it's a really simple concept. Well, this is me, hyper objects. I just had to put this in uh, because now after all these years, this is how I'm sort of, I think I'm thinking about some of these uh, issues. And the last one, centennial extinctions. That's how I pronounce it, gotten heck for doing that, but most people might are familiar with that and if they're not, I can quickly uh, go over that. So everybody's going, what? I came here to listen to the wall brand stuff. And we're showing this, and I'm going, okay, now we're in the wall brand. There's no difference. All right, the players are different. The concepts stay the same. Everybody would say, hey, that's a really cool marble mirrorlet. So these little flying footballs where the adults, if you want, hang around the estuaries fishing, so it's most important. You know, it took us, at least, I think Randy Stoltman and a lot of other players in the early Carmana days, it took us almost 10 months to convince several people in the ministry that water flows downhill. <laughs> Unbelievable, you know? And that's why the upper Carmana needed to be set aside, not just parts of the lower. Same arguments we have today. Marble Mirla, thank you. He's, he or she, it doesn't matter, is gonna go in and feed this Marble Mirla chick nesting high in the canopy this one at 38 meters, all right, a single chick, that's part of biodiversity. The real biodiversity in terms of species and individuals are with the arthropods, and specifically the soil arthropods. You know, if this arthropod was as big as me, we'd all sit up and take notice. I am <laughs> sure of it. You know, I, they're small. That's just the way it goes. Maybe God planned it that way. I don't know. Okay, but look at these concepts. Same. It does, so you don't have to be in the tropics to appreciate them. Okay, here we go. So biophilia. How good are we feeling? You know, 
what do we have for anthropocentric? Didn't we have like ego and biocentric? Didn't we have eco? I think we saw that in the slide. Oh, absolutely. Those two things are dichotomous for sure. So what's biophilia? How do you feel? In other words, certainly literature's there, the innate tendency to focus on life and life-like processes. How do we feel when we go to the Carmana Valley and see these large trees, this intact in certain areas of ecosystem, as opposed to taking somebody from the Ministry of Force and taking them to that area? Our feelings are going to be different. And I would say that what we really need to do, and everybody here has probably done it, get rid of this ego and take that energy and make it a lot more biocentric. That's how we should be feeling about these special areas. They are absolutely important as repositories for biodiversity. Oh, this is like late bedtime reading. You know, I think I've read this at least 20 times. Oh my goodness. Unbelievable. So there's a rich history associated with this. How about biodiversity? Something easier, right? This is what we all strive for. Aren't we supposed to understand and maintain biodiversity? E.O. Wilson said that we are going to make or break biodiversity on the planet by the early 2001, 2002. He said this back, back in the 90s. If we don't, it's going to be a giant mess. Remember, biodiversity got punted off the stage. We haven't solved anything. It's a giant mess. Biodiversity is the integration of biological variability across all scales, from genetic level processes to landscape level processes. We tend to want to break it into three different groups, whether it be functional, compositional, or structural. Hard to study, easy to say, I would think. And what are we doing? We, I don't know, we're lost in this Venn diagram somewhere. We're getting rid of all the structure of these forests, and when we do that, we actually change the composition for several species that rely on, those, on that structure. Well, what a mess. So many areas that have problems with processes and function in them, whether they be large-scale fire outbreaks, insect outbreaks, etc. My ode to the insects. They run the forest. I don't think there's much doubt about that. Well, here's just my ranting. Okay? Hyperobjects. It's like a giant black hole. So what's a hyperobject? Well, Timothy Morton would say it's entities of such vast temporal and spatial dimensions that they defeat traditional ideas about what a thing is in the first place. What is a forest? You know, it relates back to how you feel about it in this biocentric, biophilia um, idea. Well, I can tell you that it's just a sad day every time I see a tree on the back of some crazy you-know-what logging truck going to Duke Point. I mean, it's devastating, because I know in the system what that actually means. It means something like this. Carmana Park and the trees are gone. They're sucked into this black hole and replaced by that. Unbelievable. And we can do, have done this over a large scale, whether it be on the Walbrand, Vancouver Island, coastal BC, Canada, the Boreal, and Canada. The same things go on all the way around the globe. How do you think we got to three trillion trees? Because everything gets pushed, I think, into a black hole. And we want to ignore that. We don't want to. OK, some of the problems with that, just briefly, not a lot of science. You know, there's a lot of forest dwelling species and other things that don't like edges. I mean, that's just a general statement. Okay, let's take it, this contiguous block of habitat. There's big trees, small trees, etc. Measure the edge out on it. There's like 100 meters there. And then we do this new forestry, which came about, I would say a lot, because of a lot of hard work by people, but also to try and address maintenance of biodiversity in ancient forests. But this was back in the 90s. You know? Well, look at what happens to the edge. All right, it now gets up to 16 hundred meters. I mean, it's just simple math through that. This is a bad situation for many species. As we go from a large piece, it's perforated, it's like chomped on, 
and it continues down this path. And that's exactly what you saw, or are seeing in the wall brand, that's exactly what you saw from Bobby's slides and a few of the slides that I had before this. We don't have to study the outcome, we know what it's gonna be. It's gonna be a loss of species in those areas. Now species that love second growth forests and plantations, oh, they're gonna do really well. But I'm here to tell you that loses a lot of really interesting species. Everybody still awake? Yeah. This is good, I'm just, you know, I can only see two rows deep. <laughs> okay, this is good. So we gotta be enthusiastic, that's what I would say. Well, we can remedy this situation over time. We've got so much opportunity to sort of get forests back into this ancient forest setting. But as, I think, Ray, as you said, how's that possible? The rotation is, what? 40 or 50. 40 or 50 years? No kidding. 40 or 50 years to mimic the structural integrity and the functionality of these ancient forest trees that are 300 years plus of age? I, I say that because forests that were replanted in the 60s have already been cut again. Okay, that's why I say that, okay? And I think, you know, I mean, the point's well taken for sure. It's definitely not going to get 300 years and above. There is no way. You know, when you look at 96% plus, I don't care what it is, of a land base, potentially could be in these mismanagement zones, manage the, you know what, out of them and leave the ancient forests alone. Mm. Yeah. It's pretty simple. Because of all the scientific evidence that was just bad plan if you homogenize and liquidate everything. Oh, you know, I look at this and I go, you know, this is, this is the good scenario, potentially. If I remember that previous slide, what is this gonna look like in 25 years? All of the ancient forest trees are likely to be gone. I mean, it's disgraceful. Oh, but they've done their science. We've got connecting corridors. We know what we're trying to maintain. We've minimized roads, really. They all run side by side. So there's everything possible wrong with this slide for several species. Welcome to the reality of the BC Ministry of Forests. I hope the Deputy Minister is not in the audience, but that's the way it is. Can Why I don't we sit down and talk? Uh, Absolutely. The Auditor General of BC in 2012 basically asked the question, who's thinking of the long term beyond what's called free to grow about 600 years? Do you like to know who's looking after the long term? Us? No one. No one. Yeah. It's under law. Okay. No one is looking after our forests, our public lands, over the long term. That's what the Auditor General said. Absolutely. You can find it on the internet. Yeah. So that says it all. No one's looking for this long, looking after this long term. Holy smokes. If 20 years is a problem, what is a thousand years gonna be like? You know, and that's the issue. 20 years is a little second hand. A thousand years is a minute hand maybe. It's absolutely unbelievable that we can't as humans get this time, temporal sequencing, figure it out. Nobody can think 15 years down the road. Absolutely nobody, especially people making decisions. So we end up like this. Oh my <coughs> goodness, this is what time is doing to us. I think when I started with Richard Ring and Rob Bennett and others looking at the biodiversity in the Carmana, I would say that the minute hand is in around here. That minute how hand is now squeezing the life out of everything in these forests. What do you think this minute hand is gonna look like with inside of 20 years? It's gonna be somewhere up here. And you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means this. You can replace that bear with ancient forest trees. I couldn't do that on PowerPoint, so I just clipped it in the side. Take that, put it in, it's gonna mean essentially massive extinction. That's what it means. And the next set of slides will show you, well, who cares? Well, I had to put this in. I took my evil Pope slide out. Didn't think it might be the thing to do. But we can look at some specs here and we can look at humans and the extinction crisis. Well, humans and the extinction crisis of trees, I don't care. We're like, you know, what is it? In 2016, 7.4 billion people, holy smokes. 
You know, when I was in a conference in India, I don't know, I must have been thinking I was a young, naive grad student, and I was. So a guy named Bill Lawrence, who's a, an incredible mind, an incredible population, was standing, population ecology was standing up, talking about loss of, of, a, of a tropical rainforest, going on and on, and this is in India, right? So it was packed, and he was alluding to overpopulation, et cetera. And at that particular conference, our population was about 7 billion. So somebody in the audience, I mean me, stood up and said, well, Bill, what's the carrying capacity for humans on this planet? And he thought, he had thought about this a lot, because he's probably not the only person who asked that. But without hesitation, he said 2.4. Is there a difference between 7.4 and 2.4? Oh, absolutely. So there's lots of issues out there. As humans continue to populate the planet, the extinction rates go up. Now, nobody probably likes that, ac that axis. It's sort of truncated off, but it's, it's, it, we're talking billions there. Point is, extinction crisis is very real. Well, crazy scientists, this is what we do. You know, we look at small scale, sort of the size of this room, sort of structures and processes, and try to infer the the bigger picture. We often study single species. Why are we doing this? Well, it's academically interesting. I don't know, is it practical? Um, I would say in a lot of sense, no, because everybody ignores anything that's found here. What we all need to be doing is concentrating on this, looking at something like the phys physical and structural attributes that things like ancient forest trees provide. Where are those trees? What is it at heterogeneity? in that system. Well, everybody here can see that the more heterogeneity you have, the more structural complexity ha you have, the more species are, you are going to likely have. That's it. Put the big period after. We don't have to look at all of this to make that conclusion. Greater structural complexity equals greater number of species, and certainly there's a lot of species that are specific to that structural integrity. Well, what's the structural integrity in our forests? It's contained in these ancient forest trees. It's not replicated in second growth forests. So this old adage that we fought in the 90s, oh yeah, we can take these trees down, we can replant the area, it doesn't make any sense at all when we talk about maintaining biodiversity. Well, we can get the trees, we can do the white knuckle airline and climb with your eyes closed or something. A lot of really neat innovations such as GoPros, digital photography, social media to get the word out there. The basic scientific techniques, I think the Canopy group um, globally has this covered. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. So we're ready to attack, so to speak. Well, what do you conclude? Because you're all happy to be in the Sumatran rainforest. What do you conclude? I mean, there's more species of plants there than anywhere else. Um, it's going to disappear. Well, it, it has disappeared, replaced by oil plantations, oil palm plantations. Mm -hmm. And you could, if, if you're on the floor and you see that forest gone, and there's these oil palm plantations, oh my goodness. And if you have a strong biocentric biophilia feeling, it's devastating. Same sort of thing when you're in the Waldron. Maybe you're in the Congo, as several of uh, my colleagues have been, and you're wading through the lowland rivers and lowland gorillas are wading up towards you, they potentially could be gone as this illegal logging, this framework, fragmenting of the habitat continues unabated. Those species are going to be gone. It's a concern. Well, that might be gorillas, and you're saying, well, here, he go, here he goes again. Well, okay, let's pull us back to temperate rainforests. What do you conclude when you read Farewell to the World's Most Biodiverse Northern Ter Temperate Rainforest? Should I put it in big blocks of Waldron Valley? Might as well. Doesn't matter. Okay? We can't afford, for a lot of reasons, hopefully I've given you, to lose these forests. Oh, we could lose them and they look like that. Who in their right mind would say that they're maintaining biodiversity in these systems when this is an outcome? Nobody that I know that has some common sense. Lots of players in here. What does this mean for black bears? Something as, as common, quote, as that. We're talking about population viability, if you're talking on the scientific route. 
It's not like, oh, there's a black bear. We're looking at population phenomena. What's going to happen to that? Well, as we heard at the opening of these talks, what does this mean for salmonids in these streams and the species that are dependent on those salmonids and that transfer salmonids into the forest, which is work done by Tom Reich in, uh, in the biology department? So it's this interaction, this inherent variability that we are disrupting, severing these bonds. Shouldn't make you feel good. I gotta have some feel good slides in here. There's a feel good slide. You know, I'm not, I haven't sampled the Car or the wall brand, Carmenta wall brand using this at all. You know, so this is one of our African uh, studies, but it really does introduce this extinction phenomenon, centennial extinctions. Well, what is that? Well, it's loss of species unknown before their demise and hence unrecorded. So I would ask you, is this going on in places like the Walbrand? Are there species there that are essentially unknown before their demise, because they're associated with ancient forest trees, so they go unrecorded? So what would you say? You'd all say, I haven't even listed a, a clap yet. <laughs> We'd all say, absolutely. Why isn't, this is not just a tropical phenomena. It's a temperate forest phenomena for sure. You know, we published on this, oh my goodness, sorry Richard, 1996 we put a paper out saying this is what's happening based on the data we got from the Carmana, Carmana wall brand. This, this is like, you know, man, maybe many people weren't even born back there, I don't know. Oh my goodness, what is going on? Well, how many people know the story of this Santana Ridge? I'm looking for hands, I can only see the front row. Nobody, this is perfect. So we're in Ecuador, and guess what? We're going to the top of Tapui Mountains. They're like islands in the sky. Because they're isolated, which is a real driver in speciation, as I've said, there were species that were unique to the top of those mountains. So who would go and sample those mountains? Well, a team of crazy botanists got their own money together. They helicoptered out to these sites. They repelled down into the forest on the top of these Tapui Mountains. And they do what botanists do, they collected plants. <laughs> well, they collected plants, many of them really unique to science. They, they didn't even have names on them. Many of them were almost jet black. So lots of weird things potentially going on. So again, they continue on with what botanists do. They go back to the herbarium in Illinois and they press these plants and they try to make some sense of what they collected. Really hard to do, they're new species. Well. They're saying, well, we need to go back to that area. And four years later, they got enough money together. National Geographic sponsored them. They go back to this, these Tapui Mountains. They repel out of the helicopter into a coffee plantation. Those plants, the only record for those plants is in the museum. They're gone. They can't find them anywhere else. And I'm suggesting that's exactly the scenario that's happening in the Walbrand. And this is what some crazy people end up doing. Oh, I hate heights. I just hate it. Is that you? No, that's not me. I stole this off of the Ancient Forest Alliance yeah, site. Yeah. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> if it was me, I'm hoping I wouldn't remember. <laughs> that's what I'd say. But we've done these big climbs for sure. But what's wrong with this scenario? There was a tree surrounded. Yeah, exactly. A single tree surrounded by a sea of disturbance. Here's our management techniques at work. We're going to maintain biodiversity by doing something like this. I mean, this is a gross example, if you want. But what is the outcome of species that are dependent on these types of trees? Well, the species for this, they're going to go extinct. They're fragmented into extinction. But we're still publishing, and yeah. Well, this is like a celebration to me. So, new species, and it's taken almost forever to describe uh, new species, and that's the way that the world of taxonomy <laughs> works. From the collections that we made in the Carmana wall brand, we described, oh, wait, taxonomists have described over 60 species. So they were new to science, didn't have names on them, they described them. Well, I'm estimating based on a bunch of sort of math and stats, et cetera, that we're talking about at least 500 species that are new to science. 
You know, this early work that we did, we've gone from 30,000 species of insects, and I'll throw arthropods in there for maybe sort of Canada, and that estimate easily is more than double. So even across this great country of ours, we don't know what's going on with many of these species. Well, our projection for the lowly Carmana Valley was we're dealing with probably in excess of 30,000 species. And, you know, I can say, well, that's what, lots of scientists say, that's just pie in the sky. You're absolutely incorrect. And I'm saying, here's my response. Well, it could be. Go out and prove it. And that's, what it's, that's the question I'm throwing out there. And go out and do something about it before we end up obliterating all these forests and never get a chance to answer that. Well, Rob, I thought you'd be happy. Exura Picea. Perfect. So there's lots known about this spider now, but this, this tarantula, uh, if, if you want, is really ha has viable populations in ancient forests. Not new to science, but lowly flies certainly are. This description just came out less than a year ago. A whole set of new flies only found from these forests. I can't help it if I'm named after a fly. <laughs> so we look at this and we go, wow, new species. You want more evidence? This is really where the evidence is. It's in these thick, rich, suspended soil mats, which contain this soil community of microarthropods. They're magnificent. Well, Walbran, oh my goodness. There's a species found there and nowhere else where Zoe Lindo is certainly behind the effort to try and get this listed, um, which means a rare and threatened species, if you want. But there's been some issues with that, which we won't get into. But it's a species new to science. This list just keeps on going. Whether it be named after somebody like me or my climber, Kevin Jordan, all of these things, the list just keeps on rolling out the door. Not surprising to find new species. You could probably do that in your backyard. But here's the kicker. These species are found only in the canopy of these ancient forest trees. They're not found on the ground. They're not found in second growth forests. I think I climbed enough second growth forest trees that I don't have an issue. I mean, there's no structural integrity. There's hardly any branches to hold on to without crashing to the ground. You don't see these big, thick moss mats, which we'll look at a little closer. So let's summarize those points. We should all have an appreciation of what biodiversity really is. Our biophilia ethics should be really, really strong. Don't let anybody ever tell you it isn't. You know, so you're on a blockade. There's people that don't like that. What biophilia ethic do they have? They don't have one. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Extinction phenomena should be hopefully now familiar with, wow, these are some major things that are going on. You might want to forget about hyper objects unless you want to be my best friend. I don't know. It's kind of cool when you think about it. It's just these, these things we absolutely have a hard time understanding. It's just these big scale things happen. The result is loss of biodiversity and the extinction spasm. Well, I can clip through the next set of sh uh, shots very well. Well, here we are somewhere up in, I'm glad I made these things really big to cover the forest. This is our canopy studies, if you want, so Carmana Walbran, and then all the sub subsequent studies we've done, which is essentially my career encapsulated. And the amazing thing is that in several of those areas, even though the players in the system, as I said, are different, the proportional structuring of communities of species in these forests are exactly the same. In other words, they're not significantly different. That's stunning because look what we've done. We've expanded the spatial scale. And that's why we can take things, statements from tropical studies, and they apply almost directly to our temperate forests. So there's a wealth of information out there. How people can make decisions by ignoring that information is beyond me. Short-term thinking, maybe that's what it is. So, is this what my audience looks like? No. I gotta get my glasses on. I'm exhausted. I absolutely am exhausted with this issue. Oh my goodness. Like, what do I have to do? Do I have to go on the logging or do I have to spike trees? Do I have to get a ground to ground missile so I can take yarders out? I don't know. I'm getting pretty close. You know, we're fine with having this 
round, this massive round of ecological terrorism perpetrated by whoever, well, we know who it is. So I'm thinking, hey, what? They don't get arrested or whatever else. Maybe I'll do something one of these days. Might make it. It might make a difference. It certainly wasn't gathering all this objective information. Now, I'm not suggesting we, uh, we do a lot of that activism extreme stuff. But you know, I had these exact same talks in the 90s. Oh, we had a group of us that were so fervent, we were absolutely going to stop logging at all costs. If they didn't like the objective information, we were going to do something. Oh, I'm sorry to say that. I, I, say that. I, mean, I told you I was going to pop off. Wow. So what we, as we sit there, what hypotheses or what general questions can you frame? What do you think about um, in terms of going to these forests? Well, it might be how might biodiversity vary? Maybe among species? Size differences for sure. I mean, I look at this and go, oh my goodness, what is more attractive to me? Oh. <laughs> these one millimeter or less mites, oh my goodness. You know, this wolf isn't as big as my English master by far. Who cares? You know? So I'm trying to get over the point that it's not the actual species identity, a mite versus a wolf. I'm just saying that it should be all species we're concerned with. Well. The big player in the system is this, absolutely. Maybe this is all I want to hug, is the tree. This is what we need to start embracing as the, and we have, I think, as the real template of why we want to conserve these areas. Well, we'd like to do this over time, as we talked about a little bit, and certainly space. We've got to be large in our thoughts over a long period of time. That goes against everything that I know about. Uh, in these forests. What's happening in these forests it is short term. It is small, but it's cumulated small. I mean, a watershed's small. Well, we don't have very many things left, do we? So let's look at this question. Do ancient temperate rainforest canopies contain separate arboreal communities? I mean, this is the real kicker because it gets rid of that argument. Take down the trees. It doesn't matter because those species are everywhere. So that's really what I was faced with back in the, in the mid to late 90s, how to answer that question. And here's what we did. Oh, this looks like Vancouver Island. These are the canopy sites that we looked at because it wasn't good enough to just do the Carmanna wall brand, was it? Oh, the Ministry of Forest said, well, maybe it's just unique to that area and doesn't happen anywhere else. <laughs> so I said, okay, we'll sample these other areas. Are there any trees left in them? Well, that's what I did say. That design well, there's little pockets for sure. So what are those areas up up the up on the island? So we've got Mount Cain, yeah. and then we've got just south of that uh, ma uh, the mass site. Mm -hmm. So this Montane Alternative Silviculture System site. Mm -hmm. So lots of neat things going on in that, and that's where a lot of the quote science uh, came from. But I'm boiling it down to well, there's a study organism. Oh my goodness. And the study organisms, absolutely wonderful. But wow, a lot of the activity is way up here. Oh, I have time for a brief story, I think. Yeah, okay. Here's the story. So a group of intrepid biologists, I don't know, I just tagged along, decided back in the mid-90s to go to the Carmana because it was a big issue. It was going to be cut. It was going to be taken down. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like the Walbrand issue. Absolutely. We go up there. I was exhausted, but one thing for sure, I go, whoa, I've never seen trees that big before. I'm then laying on a, a riverbank, gasping for air. Little did I know that next to me was a, a couple of, of Shane Kennedy, Randy Stoltman, and a few other big players, and Shane Kennedy just put in a canopy system in Sarawak. I look up through these sunlit windows coming the canopy, and I just spouted off and said, wouldn't it be great to see what's up in those trees? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so Sheen, being the person he was, exactly a week later, gave me a phone call, and he said, well, you, we granted your wish. We can get you to the top of those trees. Well, you know, I'm on the phone, and I'm sure my chin hit the floor. 
I turned white because I do not want to get up in those trees. I want to know what's there, but I don't necessarily want to climb. But that's how it started. This is the start of the Carmana. It's capsulated, like I said, in this in Paul uh, George's uh, book, absolutely in detail. But it's just like the Carmana. So here's what we did. We took five giant Sitka spruce trees. We had access to those trees, and we had access between the different levels of those trees. Because as I'm thinking, well, things could be different at different levels. And then we can actually sample at these different levels, and we can walk between the trees on these Burma, or I, I called them bungee bridges at the time. Oh mm -hmm. my god, I thought I died and went to wherever I was going. <laughs> so that was the early days, and I look back at these, they're in slides now, I'm looking back, God, I wish I had GoPros, and I wish I had a bunch of other things, because it would totally change a lot of things. It's magnificent, it's unbelievable for those of us that have done work and been up in these forest canopies. So it went everywhere, right? There were like eight documentaries, there was David Attenborough, there was Azuki, there was a whole team of National Geographic people, it went on and on. That's what we have to generate again. We have to bring, I guess, because of short-term memories, attention to, uh, to these issues. Now, I think, Bobby, I think you were telling me the other day, I think we should really act on this. You tell me why we can't get Trudeau in the top of these trees. <laughs> yeah. That's the level we need to look at. I don't know how we're going to do that, but I absolutely think that's what we need to do. Let's shoot for the top and let's go for it. You know, we have to do some. Every time as we, you know, we sit and we sit here, et cetera, there's just ancient forest tree after ancient forest tree going. Going, going, gone. Got to do something. You should ping him on Twitter. Could do that, except, you know, I'm the... <laughs> Absolutely, I have no disagreement. Bobby, did you hear that? Because he knows. I don't even have a Facebook account. I don't even have a cell phone. So, yeah. Go, go Fred. Tweet him. Tweet him. Go team, go. <laughs> I'll haul his butt up the tree, and I'll follow him. You know, no doubt about it. Look at the floral symphony wow. high in the canopy. Wow. Look at this suspended soils. Fragile central, there's no doubt about that. Um, lots of interesting things that we did, climbing so many trees back with people like Alan Berger, who was instrumental in showing that marble murlets mm -hmm. absolutely need these trees to nest in. And we'll look at that in a couple of seconds. Everybody still awake? Yeah. Going strong? This is good. This is the best part. <laughs> yeah, right. I have something to strive for. So a whole team of grad students, uh, we know how to get up trees in these uh, single rope techniques. I want to call them simple rope techniques, but they're anything but. So single rope techniques is the sort of how we access these trees. And again, I think it's the best method in our rainforest. It doesn't matter if it's, it's tropical or temperate. I don't need a canopy crane. I don't need a quarter of a million dollar French dirigible, et cetera, to get to the top of these trees and do some decent science, if that's what we need to do. I'm here to say, do we really need to do that? We know. We already have the evidence of what's there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing that's going to be missing are the trees. Well, here we go. So I look at this. I take my shot of LSD, and I'm thinking, <laughs> wow, I'm way up in the top of this tree, and there are big differences being 18 stories up in the tree compared to the bottom of the tree. Big differences in structure, et cetera, which I would have thought, and I did, at the time I think, wow, there's gotta be different species here, found here and nowhere else. Oh my goodness, what about, well that's from the, on that sort of axis if you want. <clears throat> what about on the horizontal axis from the tip of the branch into the trunk? You know, are there differences even at that level? So, branch clipping at the tips. So we sampled it. We also sampled these big lichen sort of accumulations, different habitat, structure looks way different to me. And then really the, the coup de gras, if you want, happens to be these deep suspended soils. Oh my goodness, mm -hmm. these things can be, you know, the mean might be 30 centimeters deep. They can get up to 60 centimeters for sure. There's a real viable soil there that develops over time. Wow. A few close-ups. Oh, I'm glad I took slides way back then and then digitized them. 
So that's why they look a little fuzzy. It's amazing. It's just the size perspective that you go. There are floral gardens, fungal, fruiting fungal bodies, all sorts of seedlings. It goes on and on. All right. So I'm in Costa Rica looking at orchids in the canopy. You know, it just it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. It's the uniqueness that these habitats provide. Mm -hmm. Well, take a look at them. You know, here we go. Here's why I don't. I'll say it now, Bobby. I'm sorry. This is why I don't recreational climb because these are fragile habitats period yeah lots of things happen. this will grow back over time but you can imagine it's like rock climbing climb 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 and you have an impact on the very thing you're trying to protect so because i don't like heights i'm not a recreational climber <laughs> maybe that's what it is so how would you go about finding out what species are associated with those thick moss mats well safely get into the canopy. Of course, my climbing team always went out before I did to make sure everything was okay. There we go. So this is about 40 meters up in a Sitka spruce tree. I then, I, of course, I stole my mom's bulb planter. Really easy, high tech. And then I take a soil core. I can then go back to some lab at UVic and elsewhere, and I can take and extract the soil layer by putting the that sort of soil sample in the top of these, what are called Berlazy funnels. Turn on the light, 40 watts, wait for two days. Everything that doesn't like being dried out, doesn't like the light, it migrates downwards into these collecting jars, or if you want, bags. That's how I sampled. That's how my PhD students sampled. We did a lot better job of this than I ever did. Well, hmm. this is what you get. Is this not biodiversity? Am I? absolutely missing the point that maybe even at its most simplest form, biodiversity might be the number of species and the individuals associated with those species. So go ahead, tell me how many species are in that panel? <laughs> how many individuals are in that? That's from essentially one core sample. Wow. That's what we are losing every time one of these massive trees hit the deck. How many species would be in that, in that photograph? 642, <laughs> of which 300 are undescribed. <laughs> so yeah, it's just endless. I look at it, it's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that went crazy. I don't, wouldn't, it's hard to even put it together. You can sort these out into family groups and then start to make some sense. Well, 20 years later, I'm doing the same thing. And look, oh my goodness. Well, lots of metrics, moisture, we have to identify. This goes for all the arthropods. There's a taxonomic impediment in Canada, North America, and globally. We can't identify many of these things. And the experts in the field, they're going, going, gone. They're not being replaced by students or trained by students because, hey, isn't it? It's sexier to go into med school to save humans, not other species. All right, that we need to actually have good training. And there's some good people in Canada. Oh, I know I shouldn't single you out, Rob, but there's a taxonomist, and he can vouch for everything that I've said, hopefully. It's a way to get rich. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like standing on the logging road on the blockade. There's not a lot of money in it. Lots of prestige, maybe not a lot of money. But it's real. I mean, that's what... The species tell us that's the level that we need to work at. That really tells us something. I mean, these families, for instance, this family of mites found on the ground as well, but they're different species. Well, let's put it together here because I'm taking you on my PhD journey whether you like it or not. Okay. So we sample these incredible uh, debris accumulations. Yeah, I focused in on mites. Why did I do that? Well, take a look at these soil dwelling microarthropods. Well it just happens to be the mite is mites contain the group or is the group that contain the most undescribed species. Mm -hmm. So oh my wildest dreams I didn't want to study mites. <laughs> but that's just the way it happened. You know we graphed the data out and this is what we got a lot of undescribed species new to science found nowhere else in the world but in these tree tops. So that's how that happened. You know, this axis, x coordinate, that's in thousands. OK, so now you know I'm a mite person, so to speak. There's other really cool things like these columbula, 
unbelievable. If they were huge, we'd all be, whoa. <laughs> but they're small, but like I said, it's like a grizzly bear or whatever, I don't care. We can do comparison between the ground and the canopy. You know, we can look at alpha diversity, which is just diversity of species at a particular site, and know that there are a lot of species that are on the ground. There are more species that are on the ground than there are in the treetops. Well, the whole point is, it's a forest. It's the treetop species and the ground species. You can take the forest wing, you're gonna lose both components. Well, this is exciting. What does this mean? Well, simply that I can sample in the wall brand. We all know how to do that now. I can compare the wall brand to an adjacent valley, and guess what? The species are different. Oh my. So it's not just small scale. It's treating this, well, not anymore, but a large scale contiguous forest. We're not talking about some piddly little Carmana Valley that, or Walbrand Valley. We're talking about let's go up to, let's extend that to Clackwet, the Great Bear Rainforest, all the way up to Alaska. That's what we're talking about because we've got this rapid turnover of species. Magnificent. Well, we can conclude this. These beetle mites are orbat and mites. Really, there are more species on the ground than there are in the tops of the trees. There's no doubt about that. But they're different. That's the key feature of new species. New species, like I said, in your backyard doesn't much matter. But here, the new species, a lot of them are confined to specific habitats, such as ancient forests. Taxonomic distinctness, if you want, across these spatial scales. That's a huge surprise. Every single forest, these large trees, is important. It's not just the case of, well, we've set aside one area, we can liquidate the other. If we liquidate the other, we're going to cause extinctions big time. We are causing extinctions. Well, you're not off the hook yet, you know. Basic diversity measures the number of species richness and their abundances, the number of individuals. They increase as you go from the branch to the suspended soil. There, are, there is more richness, more species, and more individuals associated with these thick moss mats. Guess what? Those moss mats are only found in trees that have the structural integrity to have these big platforms to catch debris over a long period of time. Second growth forests have none of that. They're gone forever. And we've already said, time it just doesn't match. Well, this is the same ground comparison if you want. Taxonomic distinctness we find for sure. We should be really upset that we are losing species at a rapid rate and we're part of this extinction spasm. What are we going to do about it? What can we conclude? Terrestrial mites species are greater, so greater on the ground, but it's still a forest, right? So I was not saying, I had the question this morning on CBC again. Well, what's, how many species are in the canopy and does it really matter? Well, I'm saying it's the forest system. It's the canopy and the forest floor when you look at total number of species. Why is that so? There's this taxonomic dis distinctness. Well, this really pulls into academia for sure. Maybe it's microclimate differences. There's all sorts of speculation. We really think, and we've honed in and put some good stuff out in Silly Lindo, it's the dispersal capabilities, and this goes towards that fragmentation slide I showed you. How good are species going from one area to another? One suitable piece of habitat to another. Really, really poor. They're not good dispersers. They're locked in these areas. Disrupt that area, fragment it. See ya. Okay, nice slide. Nicer slide. Here we go. This is what we're disrupting. This is what we're going to end up losing. Well, I could tell everybody didn't like my, I don't know why that's so. <laughs> So let's look at briefly at other players in the system. So marble murelets, oh my, we worked extensively on this with Alan Berger. I, you know, the first re nesting records were found in, for all of Canada, really in the Carmana, based on that early work. Oh my, you can sit at the riverbank, you know, early in the morning and you have hundreds of marble murelets flying up these creeks. You can climb hundreds, literally thousands of trees and never find a nest. What is going on? I still don't know. They fly up. I don't know where they're scouting out here. You can't find a nest. 
Well, in the States, they do a lot better job. It's an endangered species there. Here, it's a threatened species in the province, so the CDC would color code it as blue. All right, it's a species of concern, if you want. Um, don't worry about the rankings. Kosiwik listed as threatened, but I'm saying we're taking the nesting habitat out at a rapid and accelerated rate. What do you think the outcome for marble murrelets are gonna be? Hey, maybe marble murrelets are just gonna say, I'm fed up with this, I'm gonna nest on the ground. Doesn't happen here. They need architecture. So Rob Van Pelt in a, down in the States, along with Steve Sillett, actually is some incredible architectural drawings. I mean, there's a lot to be learned by the structure of the, in these canopies. It doesn't just relate to forest biology, ecology, there's all sorts of neat things that are happening. We don't care about this, except to say that murrelets, excuse me, they need these mats to nest in. There's what they nest in, there's the nest. Incredible, well, it's just the depression, all right? There's the marble murrelet, there's the marble murrelet on the nest, there's the chip. They lay single eggs, something happens to that egg, Wow, that's it. They don't double clutch, or rarely do. I'm not going to need to read through this, simply to say that the conclusion was that what's needed for successful nesting certainly are these nest platforms, this thick, suspended soil. That is only found in old trees, nowhere else. So we need big, old trees if we're going to do something about impacts on this species. Oh, I love these nests. You know, I think I like this because I climbed so many trees looking for these, I've hardly ever seen any. You know, climb a thousand trees, there's a nest. Thank you. So, anybody doing helicopter surveys to maintain biodiversity, which I think is what they're doing, they'll say, oh yeah, there's a good nest tree. We're going to maintain biodiversity for murrelets. Are you kidding me? You know, I would say get on the floor and actually see what you're protecting. And I'll show you in the next couple of slides why that is such a bogus statement to make. Nests are located on big trees. That's what that says. Small gaps in the canopy are typical. Notice I say small gaps. It's because these things are flying footballs. They don't, they're not good flyers. They're awesome underwater. That's what they're structured for, chasing prey underwater. They fly into forests. It's like a guided missile. They're footballs. They just go. You know how they land in these small gaps? They get to three, they crash into the tree. <laughs> right, they hit the tree and they fall down onto the mat. I've never seen a graceful landing. Well, probably because I haven't seen a nest. They don't do that. But there's a problem in our situation. We're going to maintain biodiversity. Why is that so? Because we maintain it in areas like this, right? It just so happens that the distribution of marble murrelets coincides almost perfectly with logging and other changes, certainly logging. Increased coastal wind storms linked to climate change may also impact nesting colonies. But wait a minute, wind at edge is way more of a different beast than it is in the interior of an intact forest. What stupid murrelet would nest on the edge? Well, lots of them because the nesting habitat is essentially gone. These single trees that are left up on edges that are suitable, sure, if they're gonna nest, we're gonna go to that because we're not nesting on the ground yet. We can't speed evolution up that fast, I don't think. So far, forest harvest rotation times, harvesting, do not allow old growth or ancient forest characteristics to develop. That's the take home message there. It's, there's not enough time. We can get rid of that and we can say, oh yeah, well, can I understand this? Is there some crazy scientist that made this sort of understandable? Does this look familiar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like almost like my, I don't know, some third or fourth slide. The effects of fragmentation is just not good. Well, people didn't experiment on this. They looked at the chief predator for marble murrelet nestlings and eggs, Stellar's J. These loud, raucous corvids are glorious. I can't have a species bird. Sort of mimics our premier, I don't know. <laughs> but they did an incredible study where they essentially put artificial eggs in nests on a distance gradient from the edge through to the core of the forest. And guess what? What would you predict? Predation rates were highest, at, almost 100% at? 
the edge. Oh my goodness, who needs to do this type of study? This is kind of cool. But it sh goes to show what we sort of thought. Do we have to prove it again? You create edges, and I've shown how edges are easily created, depending on what we're doing, and yet we're managing biodiversity. Isn't what, isn't, Bobby, isn't that what they said? Managing biodiversity for marble murrelets on the flyby helicopter? Oh, there's an old growth tree on the edge. Perfect. Sure. Okay, expanding spatial scale, looking at these LDDs, or these long spatial scale dispersal mechanisms, if you want. This is sort of the science stuff, and I know people are getting bored. But we did all of this to say, hey, what goes on in one valley? We know it's, it's going to be different, different species. Same sort of processes across a large spatial scale. It's hard as a scientist to do that. Think about it. Is it easy to study things in one area or several areas across several thousand kilometers? Oh, my goodness. Well, that's what we did, uh, driven by Zoe. So, you know, that, I just tagged along, I think. And I think with the support of Richard tagged along. Um, but address this question. We use Clackwood Sound. There are the watersheds that we sample. We sampled five watersheds. It just about did me in. So in each watershed, we looked at old growth or ancient forest trees associated with that. Three plots per estuary, three trees per plot. We sampled 45 trees. Everybody's going, well, that's cool. Well, we didn't sample just one tree. So this actually is the type of evidence that's objective, holds up in science. Why isn't this being used to make decisions in our forest setting? Well, I took all the stats out, but I just couldn't delete all the graphs. All right, and so our program, I would say, if this reaches an asymptote, this is awesome. We've done enough sampling, who wants to do more? And essentially it gets pretty close, shows what I've already told you, there are more species on the ground than there are in the canopy, based on the number of individuals, and this is species on this axis. Well, look at the database. You know, for the canopy, it's over 10,000 individuals. Oh yeah, we identified every one of them. Had scope eyes, I don't know what happened. We identified everything from the ground, almost 20,000 individuals to species. And that's what we found, 146 <coughs> species, 82 species in the canopy. That's almost the same proportion as if we were in some place nice like the bond. I don't know. Same sort of thing. It doesn't matter what scale you're at. It's the, if it's the core we're looking at, all the way to the watershed, spatial scale's increased, right? Look at the diversity. It is always greater on the ground than it is in the tree. Well, that's important, sure. But I'm telling you that this diversity on the ground would be thrashed if you lost the trees, i.e. the canopy. Gone forever. Cute, cute, cute. <laughs> and even cuter. <laughs> you know, wouldn't you just like to grab and hold on to these? Better still, I think we should have something where we have Halloween costumes. People could look just like that. Instead of being a Sasquatch on the road, it would be an orobatted mite. It would be perfect. Freak everybody out. Awesome. Uh, this is my favorite slide from my whole entire career over the last 20 years. Who cares about the stats or the sampling? Things are most alike on the ground, and things are most alike in the canopy. It's a perfect separation, statistically supported for sure. So this essentially says the community of soil arc microarchopods, mainly mites, they're the same across the spatial scale on the ground. That similar phenomenon happens in the canopy, distinct arboreal communities, which goes to show, I think conclusively, that these Canopies, which can't be recreated, are most important for several species. Oh, who climbs like this? Wow. Greater than expected beta diversity, this change in diversity across these different scales. This is what's really cool. Remember, we're looking at dispersal here in this paper. Arboreal or these canopy communities are influenced by environmental factors, wind, big windstorms, etc. Whereas the ground, it's a spatial architecture. Those old trees that have died, quote, naturally, fall into the floor and are incorporated back into the system. This historical legacy over long periods of time is crucial. So dispersal in the canopy is long distance. You know, I'm in a moss mat, big windstorm. I get blown off that tree. Where do I land? 
You know, it's like, you know, it could be a big probability. I'm very much happy. I can, I can, I can imagine myself as a mite in a moss mat. I get blown off of the tree, that's my home tree, and guess what? I fall, in, fall into another ancient forest adjacent old growth tree. Awesome. And I can make it in that tree. But guess what? The situation that we have is it's a sea disturbance. I'm on that moss mat that travels and travels down to some clear cut area. Gone forever. I don't make it. We sample blow down moss mats on the ground in cleared areas. There's virtually no canopy species there. They're predated on. They're gone. Oh, okay, we're getting close. This is what this is really sort of what we have left. This is what we need to protect. I know this is not from the wall brand, but similar type of slides as to what Bobby showed. Magnificent areas. Lots of things we need to be worried about. Why are we letting these areas well? We're witness the, the liquidation of these areas. Not by us, obviously. Let's do something about it. You know, all life on Earth originated by these tardigrades, these water bearers that came to the Earth on asteroids, right? <laughs> asteroids hit, poof, there's a life form. That's where we all come from. Something like that. We haven't even looked at these. Oh my goodness. Totally undescribed group. If you take a moss core, they're literally are going to be a thousand individuals, probably from 20 to 50 species. That's a single moss core. Amazing, it's just the scale, they're small. The antibiotics. Well, these are my wrap up slides, so bear with me. What, what is out there? This is the framework for action. This is exactly the same slide that I showed the deputy minister in 1997. I haven't changed anything, oh, except to put the Spirit of the Raven symbol on it has great meaning for me. Here's our forest, depicted in these three panels. Here's one big panel. It lets intensively manage it. Let's grow trees, put our best foot forward, put our civil cultural practices to good use, grow trees, harvest them, that's what we want to do. That would create jobs, does it not? Sure it does. Man, the next area is there are several remaining areas that are fragmented. They have old growth components, they have cleared areas. Well, this is where the biodiversity conservation battleground is. This is where we are in the wall brand. We can't even get to testing what's the best sort of situation on the ground, what's the best configuration, how many trees can we take out. Can't do that. And so, I'm again saying we should really treat our old growth forest carefully. That goes into the last panel. Anything that's whatever size we want imagine, should be conserved without question. I don't want to know what species are there necessarily. I know if we lose that habitat, whatever those species are, a lot of them are going to be gone and gone forever. So, conservation without question, for crying out loud. Well, this is what I tried to tell the deputy minister at the time. Why are we worried about all the details necessary to support conserving ancient forest systems? I don't know. The evidence is there. Do we need to recreate those studies? I don't think so. We need to be dressed as mites and standing on the road, logging road. No doubt about it. You want to get into you want to get into the science of all of this? Well, scientists are arguing like crazy amongst themselves about everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Some really neat stuff. But for a conservation measure, it supersedes what is on the ground floor. Are we going to protect these ecosystems? Are we going to protect everything in them from western sandpipers to humpback whales to wolves to mites? If I had another panel, you're probably happy I don't. It's an amazing system for sure. We need protection, conservation without question. Maybe it is just a hyper object and it's the end of common sense. Maybe that's the time frame we're in. And with that, I'll close. Thanks for staying away. <laughs>
thank Dr. Neville Winchester and all his graduate students and Dr. Richard Ring for initiating this most important groundbreaking research into this, this dimension of life that is, that is so relatively unknown and plays such an important part in the overall health and integrity of these forests. And you know, identifying species is just the beginning. It's understanding their, their role in the, in the overall functioning of these ecosystems and, and what implications that has for how to effectively manage the, the vast tract of forests that have been, that are just growing up and recovering. Because we're looking at the, at the future here. We have to think about many, many generations ahead. And these forests have, looking at these slides, the message is clear. They have vital value, you know, in terms of the intrinsic, um, you know, value of the life forms that inhabit them, but also in terms of their, the lessons that they hold in terms of understanding these ecosystems that we have just managed in, in a man, manner of sheer butchery. And so I would like to, in thanking Dr. Winchester for his presentation tonight, um, gift him with a, a, a t-shirt um, that reflects the vision that many of us have for these forests as tribal parks. We have seen in, in Clackwood Sound uh, an extremely successful um, example of, uh, of tribal park designation that allows for traditional First Nations uses of these ancient forests uh, and economic development that does not jeopardize the, in, the ecological integrity of the forest that they depend on. And so, uh, Neville, I would like to give this t-shirt to you and hope it fits. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. 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 yeah.